you're live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the inaugural Digital Rebar Provision Meetup, version 001. So who do we have online today? We've got uh, Rob, uh, we've got Victor from uh, Rackham, myself, Shane Gibson, and Greg, Greg Alton from yep. Rackham. And we've got a couple of participants from the community, Will and Parfool. Uh, welcome, guys. Welcome. Did I catch everybody there? Sure. Sure. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to have a little bit of a discussion on an in introduction to digital rebar provision itself. We talk a little bit about naming our awesome uh, mascot, the digital rebar bear. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about provision 3.1, which is the recent release that just came out of uh, digital rebar provision. Uh, some of the neat features and uh, fixes and enhancements in 3.1. Uh, we'll kick off a little bit of discussion on future planning for digital rebar uh, 3.2, uh, what the community is looking forward to, uh, features, etc. Uh, and then we're going to, if we have enough time, uh, we'll go into a DRP demo, uh, which will be a, a fairly quick and dirty man line install of digital rebar provision 3.1. And uh, Digital Rebar 3.1, we'll do a quick deploy in the packet.net environment if we have time there. Hopefully, we'll have a lot of questions around the DRP 3.1 features and capabilities. There's a lot of really cool stuff that's in there. Um, and then we'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, future, or excuse me, resources uh, for getting help, getting in touch with the Digital Rebar community, with the larger rack end community. Uh, where are some of the places you can go and find uh, some help, etc. cetera. Uh, and then if we, then we'll do a little question and answers period. And we'll talk about uh, next time on <laughs> V002 meetup group. Sound good? All right. So we got a whole bunch of thumbs up there. And as I mentioned, we've got uh, a fair good uh, contingent of representation from RackN. RackN is our uh, sponsor, uh, corporate sponsor, and um, primary contributor and author to the Digital Rebar um, project. And so our co-founders, uh, Greg Althaus and uh, uh, Rob Hirschfeld are online with us today. I wanted to kick off things a little bit here first and say, um, Rob, what were you thinking? Uh, <laughs> what were you thinking when you started Digital Rebar? What's, what's the impetus behind what Digital Rebar is? Because there's a lot of um, provisioning tools out there, right? There's a lot of community tools out there. There's Cobbler, there's Razor, there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of them. There's a plethora of them. So, <laughs> Actually, so why do you, go ahead. Yeah, a lot of what I mean, and, and it's Greg. This was Greg and I together um, it, in the in the first days. At the time we were doing this, there weren't a lot of other tools. Um, Cobbler was really there, but dead. Um, and Chef and Puppet had just arrived on the scene as as tools that people were considering using. And we really we we've been doing field deployments and and we're literally just having to roll in the dust to keep keep our skin from catching on fire um, at, at those deployments. It would, it would be, you know, you'd go in thinking you could get things done in a couple days and it was clear that you'd need weeks of time to do a, even a basic uh, cloud infrastructure bring up. And so that's what, that was our experience, right? We were, our hair was literally on fire. Um, and we felt like there had to be a way to make these, these installs repeatable. And that's, that's what digital rebar is about. It's, it's really about trying to say, how can, you know, operators help each other to, to create repeatable stuff. Um, and we keep going, we, every time we turn around, that's what we go back to. It's how do you make operations in one data center, you know, reusable so that the time you walk to another data center, you time talk to another operator that can actually share something, right? So that a vendor walking into the data center doesn't have to do a search and discovery process at every data center and deploy people for weeks. Um, it was hard. I mean, OpenStack, we watched OpenStack implode over this uh, issue, and it's, it's really hard to solve. So 
I think Greg and I are both of the ilk of we don't like to leave a problem until we fix it. It's been years. Uh, we're, still, <laughs> we're closer. I think I think DRP is is pretty close, um, but it's hard. It's a hard problem to fix. And Greg, are you there? I <clears throat> I am. So, so what are some of the technical merits to digital rebar that thinks you put it that that you think puts it heads and shoulders above the rest? I think one of the things that we've always had as a high priority item is the ability to get intermediate feedback, fast fail. So when things go wrong, we try and get there and point that out and stop. Because a lot of the times we were dealing with issues of tools where you'd run through something and it keep running and keep running and keep running and keep running. And then you'd have to unwind large amounts of log files to go find that, Oh, I forgot to tell it to add, make a directory. Right. And then you'd have to rerun everything. Right. So part of what we always wanted to do or have available is a fast fail mentality. And so I think all of the versions that we've had kind of drive that. And then, Another we've always tried to do is have some concept of composability. The idea that you could chain things together to get something more than just what and reuse out of it, right? So, so on the composable question, uh, it sounds like um, you're touching on uh, APIs, CLI, sort of modern infrastructure as code sort of principles. Does that sound about right? So that, so I guess about, I think of it as two parts. So in, in some regards, I think within the bringing up and provisioning and, and doing the operations on the nodes, I want composability in the sense that I don't want to have to create one big thing over and over again. I want to be able to say, okay, I did this function. It works. Let's go to the next function. Does it work? Yes. And then you're right with that in place. I want to be able to repeat it. I want to be able to drive it. I want to automate it, all those things. And that's where in some regards, um, you know, APIs, drivable APIs, programmatic APIs, all those things come available. And then from there, being able to drive all that into some kind of code repository to, to track and keep under control is important too. Excellent. And, uh, Rob, what are some of the major uh, areas that you think that digital rebar it, it's sort of composable? Um, I, I refer to it as infrastructure as code since you have a very strong ability to drive configuration, bring up management and orchestration of your provisioning endpoint through pure CLI or API calls. Uh, so that, that really allows you in, in my um, thought process to uh, have the ability to uh, drive your provisioning service uh, similar to how some people will drive clusters of software. For example, Kubernetes. Uh, one of the things that you really want to do is have a very repeatable deployment pattern for Kubernetes. You want to make sure that um, one of the things that I see in the industry is a lot of people talk about the, the cool hotness of Kubernetes and deploying uh, containers and applications and solutions on Kubernetes. And everybody seems to forget that you have that bare metal layer underneath. And you have to be able to get a repeatable operating system at the end of the day. That's, you know, one of the, your, your building blocks, your, the foundational bricks that makes for a, a Kubernetes deployment. And so I, I see that um, digital rebar provision seems to have a very strong infrastructure as code and also a lot of tenants uh, around immutable uh, infrastructure that allows you to repeatably deploy. Can you talk to that a little bit? I'd be happy to. You're you're hitting one of the, the our big aha moments um, was this idea of ready state infrastructure. You'll still see that in some of our talking points, which is that if you can just get things up to a standard state, then it's pretty easy to install something like Kubernetes or OpenStack or Hadoop or whatever. And and the but the variations getting to ready state are super hard to to manage and deal with in a heterogeneous way. Right. We. I don't see anybody who's going to be happy with just buy everything the same because as soon as you do that, you're, you know, the next, next month comes out and something new is there and you want to switch or there's some reason to change. It's just homogeneity in the data centers, uh, the fantasy. So, um, yeah, a lot of, I mean, you really described actually your question <laughs> described it really well. It's, it's this idea that we are trying to build something that's ready state 
Um, the immutable infrastructure stuff we see coming down the pipe where we can deploy images directly to metal, um, where we can shorten the life cycle of, of machine images and get them much more cloud-like, it's, it's going to really revolutionize operations because you're going to have much, much more um, repeatable known infrastructure. Uh, that, it's just a huge deal. Um, and that's a big part of what we've been trying to build. So the, the idea for us is that we want digital rebar to provide that ready state infrastructure, right? Solve that problem for people and then accelerate what goes on top. So yeah. Awesome. Is that, is that it, did I, did I miss part of the question? I think it was a good no, question. no, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, so digital rebar, um, will, Seen you uh, active on the uh, community uh, channel there quite a bit. Uh, what are your experiences with Digital Rebar? Uh, well, I've been following you guys since actual Crowbar V1. Oh, oh wow, that's, that's a long time ago. Those are my early days with Rob and crew and Someone, Greg and Victor. Crowbar at a conference, a little mini conference I used to go to out in the East Coast here. And uh, I was like, wow, this sounds awesome, you know? And uh, um, I tried to dig into it and it was a little too obtuse, frankly. And I think the use case didn't fit my use case. So I understand it, Rob, that it was like basically constructed to lay out open stack racks. Is that correct? You know, is yeah, it Dell exactly right. was doing right. And so, um, but the, the idea was very powerful. So I, I kind of kept my eye on it and started using cobbler, you know, and, uh, and, you know, so then, uh, we actually were like shell scripters, you know, we'd cobbler the OS on and shell script the rest of it. And it was a big mess. And then, uh, you know, I, I go to these conferences and I kind of like was very interested in this in CF engine, which also has the obtuseness problem. And it, it suffered from bad docs, really. So it was very hard, very powerful ideas in it, but like kind of super hard to get going as a noob. And uh, then I looked into Chef, but that's right at the time Ansible came out. And from like the get go with Ansible, I got stuff done, you know? So that was awesome. And I was like, okay, how can we, you know, and it, the funny thing is Mike DeHaan made Cobbler, made Ansible, but they were not integrated, <laughs> right? So I'm looking for a one step, like, deploy the OS on the nodes and carry it through with infrastructure as a code that's in Git, right? So, but the, the node construction can't really maybe be in Git, but you want to do the bare minimum to run your tool, Ansible in my case, and do everything else in Ansible. And when I saw, I think it was Crowbar V2, that had that, I, it looked possible, but it's still like I, I found it kind of in <laughs> You know, and I, I, I shared that, you know. And so uh, when DRP came out, I was like, well, finally, like, I can understand this thing. And, and it, it, it really effectively replaces Cobbler and does so much more, and it's API-driven. And now it looks like it's the foundation of, it, it's like Crowbar V3, or it's not Crowbar, Digital Rebar mm -hmm. 3, right? So we're refactoring every step of the way. And so I'm very excited to see what can be done because I'm, I'm a use case, we're an industrial lab. I have like constant change going on. I'm, there's nothing is homogenous <laughs> ever, you know, and it's, uh, you know, and I'm a small user too. I'm not this huge corporate running X data centers. So I think it fits in my case as well as the large case. So I'm, I'm interested up the road here in this to, to see what the, I, I mean, everyone makes a product with use cases in their mind. And I, I, I'm always trying to figure out if my use case is fitting into the tools, because the you guys use case. So I think it is, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm like a very possibly different, I'm the long tail, you know what I mean? So I, I'm, I don't, I don't know that you're that much of a long tail uh, from, from the way we think about it. I think uh, the, the interesting thing, especially about provision, is that it's designed to be driven as a, a service for other, other workflows. 
So what you're describing is exactly what we want provision to do. It was, you know, originally it was in, uh, you know, digital rebar V2 as a, as a standalone thing, you know, it's because we needed that service. And so when we went around, when we looked at provision, it was, it wasn't designed, you know, we, we intentionally made it standalone because that's what people like you were asking for and simple, but the fundamental architectural decisions are really about how do we hook it to other stuff? Um, which, you know, Shane, going back to one of your questions, that to me is the big difference in what we're, what we're building here is we never assume digital rebar is a, a standalone thing. It's part of other infrastructure. It's part of other workflows. Um, and that, that's sort of the design aesthetic that we put into it. It's, you know, it's not, a, oh, once, once it's finished, you'll use the UI and do this work. You know, the cover Victor's famous for this one. It's like, nobody should ever use our UI. Um, usually he says that commenting about the design, <clears throat> but um, I'm, I'm watching him get unmuted. But, um, <laughs> but, but the, you know, the reality is that, you know, for us to be really successful, well, and I think this speaks to your use case, you, know, you shouldn't be logging in to change things. It should be triggered by another system and then working in the background for you, for you, right? And that's, if you look at 3.1, that, that's the theme for 3.1. It's like, all right, how do we get people, how do we get, you know, digital rebar out of the way um, as much as possible? Like, it's like the Unix philosophy, right? You know, small tools doing one thing well and piping yep. together. That's exactly right. Well said. Awesome. Uh, great discussion on digital rebar. I love uh, hearing from uh, operators in the field. It's always nice to stay in touch with uh, the people that are actually using, consuming, and um, uh, making uh, the reality of what the product is useful to them. And, and uh, I've been an operator and administrator and architect for many, many years. And um, I'm, I'm very excited about digital rebar. I think it's an amazing product. And um, one of my favorite things about the, the rack end team is uh, what something that Greg uh, touched on and will touched on both a little bit is um, these guys have, have not been afraid to throw away old work. And, you know, there are so many organizations that they, they accrue technical debt and they keep carrying it forward because, you know, it's, it's important to them to uh, nurture and love and care and feed for something they've created. And I understand that because you fall in love with those things that you build and you create. But um, I've always been impressed by um, the guys at Rack and, and their ability to say, okay, we made something cool. Now we got to remake it. Start over. Uh, let's take all of the lessons we learned from previously and apply that to the next generation iteration of the product. In some ways that might slow you down uh, a little bit uh, in terms of needing to remature a product. But um, I, I've always been impressed to see the iterations and generations of the product from battle hardened, scarred, tested and proven in the field experience and you can see that distilled into digital rebar provision. So I'm really looking forward to, to working with it more and uh, the rack end team is pretty cool, pretty excited about it. Uh, let's move on a little bit uh, outside of uh, just the digital rebar um, love fest and let's uh, talk a little bit about, um, first of all, um, for those of you who don't know, digital rebar itself is a 100% open source project. It's governed by the Apache Linux uh, version two license. And you can pull down the code uh, from github.com, uh, digital rebar slash provision. Uh, so you can jump right in, take a look at the code. We really, really do want to foster community involvement and participation. And uh, your input and feedback is really important to us in helping shape and drive the product forward. Um, we have a traditional uh, model uh, with a, a GitHub uh, project. We'd ask you to clone the repo. Uh, if you have any changes you want to check in, we would welcome those. Uh, do that, branch it, uh, and then make a pull request. Uh, core contributors for the provision project will review the requests and work with you uh, if there need to be any changes made to it or uh, lovingly accept it right away if you've kicked butt on the project uh, or your your features and check-ins, et cetera. Uh, so please though, do check us out there. Uh, we do really want your involvement and feedback. Um, the next topic on the agenda though, the most exciting, exciting. Topic, 
naming the digital rebar mascot. So have all of you seen our uh, uh, mascot, mascot here? here. Uh, do, uh, let me see. I don't even have it up. <laughs> it's at the top of the agenda. It's at the top of the document, the agenda document. Here, I'll, I'll show one. one. I have one. I have the stickers. You got the, the stickers. Shirt. That's right. You got to track Rob down for a, a sticker here. So this is our uh, uh, digital rebar bear. And uh, we've got sort of the full bear action with the digital rebar cloud he's sitting on. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the simplified uh, head view, which you, most of you all have seen, hopefully, on the Meetup overview page. Uh, we've had a little bit of a uh, Twitter, um, what do we call it, a tweeter poll, a, a twipple? Uh, what do you call a Twitter tweeter poll? A I'm not Twitter a Twitter poll is the official a Twitter poll. <laughs> we have a little bit of a tweeter poll going on in terms of trying to uh, hash out a name for our mascot. And so, Rob, what are some of the contenders we had? <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was a, a, a broad list. I mean, I could look up some of them. We had like Q Free, people like uh, Rebar or, or um, Rebear. Bear, Bearina, Rebear. Lumberg. Uh, Lumberg. Yeah, that's Stephen's favorite, is Lumberg. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, we had picked even uh, Fee for Iron, uh, though I think we had, a, we had a late entrant come in that everybody seems to like a lot, which is Claudia or Claudia actually. Claudia. Claudia. I like that Claudia. one. It was my favorite as well. <laughs> so are we settling on Claudia as a name for our uh, mascot then? I, I'd be interested to hear from non Racken people. Racken I think have we we've uh, we've discussed it internally so before I we we muddy the waters. I'd love to hear an external <laughs> view. Killed it as a topic. Uh, yeah Claudia man that works. But, well, there it is. It's official from uh, I'll, from the uh, <laughs> tweeted out. I feel like I just made a big decision. <laughs> you made it, Will. <laughs> Sometimes that extra voice drives consensus. <laughs> <laughs> so I, th I think it. I think it's a winner. We have Claudia is now the immutable name of the digital rebar mascot. <laughs> if it do, if the name doesn't work, you just kill it. And you instantiate them. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, digital rebar version 3.1. Big release. release. A lot of stuff in it. Yeah, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. So, uh, the release notes are on. Uh, let's see. We're, we have the release notes posted, and you can find those in the. Uh, uh, GitHub repo as well. Um, but a, a real fast summary for those of you who haven't checked out the 3.1 feature yet. Uh, features and improvements. We've got a new mascot and logo. We just covered the new immutable name for the mascot is Claudia. C-L-O-U-D-I-A. Claudia. And uh, But getting to the technical stuff. Um, some of the interesting features we have going on in this project, big feature changes, uh, or additions, I should say, not really changes, but uh, a layered storage system. So there's a concept of read-only content, so that allows some interesting use cases with that. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, there's a much broader uh, content packaging system, which allows you to group a whole bunch of stuff together into um, which I don't know that we've exactly sorted out a naming for. I'm calling just packs, content packs. I'm not sure that that's uh, caught on yet. Uh, I'll, I'll beat the rest of the guys around the, on the head and, and the rack and ranks until we decide on a cool name for it. <laughs> until everybody agrees with your, your name. I yes, you got better. it, Rob. So. <laughs> and then, uh, the, of course, there's a, a plug-in system, which is a very big uh, feature capability that allows you to plug in new ways and, and cool things to do stuff. And we're really excited to see where that goes in the community, what kind of uh, additional plugin uh, solutions we get from that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, another very major component is the ability to do stages, tasks, and jobs, which allows the whole digital rebar provisioning service to become a much more capable orchestration system, not just uh, control and provisioning, but now a larger orchestration system. 
And there's a whole lot going on around that that is really interesting. And I think we'll probably have some future uh, uh, topics on the meetup agenda covering that specifically. I think we're going to have a lot around content itself. Uh, stages, tasks, and jobs, I think, are going to be a big thing that a lot of people want to understand and learn on how to orchestrate complex deployments and complex uh, scenarios and decompose them into reusable pieces that allow you to um, restructure new deployments very quickly from existing decomposed uh, content. Um, I, one of the other things we have, we've added a WebSocket API, gives you a strong API interaction capability with the whole endpoint service as well. Uh, for some people, sadly, maybe for other people's not so sadly, we're removing the embed note. Rob's saying not so sad. So not no, sad no sadness <laughs> over removing the embedded UI. <laughs> for those of you that have seen the 3.0 uh, X versions with the green UI, which was fairly limited in its capabilities, uh, that has been completely cut out and removed. However, we have replaced that with a uh, rack and hosted portal. And the rack and hosted portal uh, has very quickly um, received a lot of very positive feedback from the community members. And it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's matured yet, but it has grown very quickly in capabilities and features. And um, I think um, it's fair to say it's uh, still in a strong beta or tech preview stage. There's still some uh, minor issues we're tweaking and working out. Uh, but as those of you out in the field use it, we're really looking forward to how you use that portal and giving us some good feedback on, on using that. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, once you deploy a DRP endpoint, it's very simple. Point your web browser, HTTPS, uh, endpoint IP address colon 8092. It'll redirect you to the rackend.github.io portal. Um, it's important to note that the portal does not ever communicate directly with your endpoint. So for those of you that are security conscious and concerned about your provisioning infrastructure, yeah. the endpoint uh, is itself can be buried deep inside your infrastructure and your um, web browser essentially becomes a, um, a I want to say proxy. Proxy is not a good term to use because it's a well overloaded um, phrase, has a lot of specific uh, context and meaning. Um, I'm going to say maybe conduit. There was a better word I saw in documentation, Rob. I don't know if you remember. Uh, you guys had come up with a really good, uh, it allows you to transfer Control. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a cross. It, the 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 technical. It's a cross origin um, site. It's a or core. Don't get all technical on us. Uh, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> but it's it it is it's a it's a it's an intermediate man in the middle. Um, in yeah, a good way. Exactly. Man in the so. So that you're, you're, you orchestrate and manage uh, doing things in conjunction with a portal, and so your, your web browser becomes the intermediary uh, between your endpoint and the portal. Um, uh, so, but you also will have some uh, broader capabilities with a portal that will allow you to do organizational content. You can maintain content related specifically to your private content library, uh, and you'll be able to do a lot of other very interesting features we have coming up around the por the portal. In addition to that, it's just it's a great UI I think for uh, interacting with the your DRP endpoint. I mean, everybody in, in you know immutable infrastructure infrastructure as code and APIs. Everybody talks about let's do everything with the API API, which is cool. But you know humans are visual creatures, and it's a lot easier to digest content and configuration and how things work from a good UI. So I, I'm, I'm happy to see that that portal is there and I'm looking forward to exploring that more in future meetups. Um, getting back to the f um, features and improvements, um, do we have any specific questions that people wanna, directions you wanna talk about in the existing 3.1 features and capabilities? Uh, or do we wanna just go down the list and cover briefly what all of those are? So I, that's, I, I saw that's you, in, Will. I saw <laughs> you in the UI. There's like, it looks like there's there's community content, and then there's some. Um, if you're a Rackin commercial customer, that unlocks further content. Correct. Yes, that's that's, that's actually a good observation. Yeah. Um, basically, there's there's three levels of content. There's uh, community. Uh, provided content. So there's a, a general usable amount of content for provisioning in your environment that is maintained and owned by the, the content 
um, proctored a little bit, obviously, uh, via rack end. Um, that's the first level of content. The second level is freely available content to registered users of the portal. So if you register at the portal, you, you then uh, get access to uh, additional content, still free, but there are a lot more powerful features and capabilities in that additional rack end registered content. So that's the second level. The third level will be uh, registered users and pay for content, which is uh, the next step level of even further um, stronger capabilities and um, more de uh, deeply detailed capabilities that you might need or, or require in an environment. That might also be if you engage with RackN for um, commercial support and services where we develop content specifically for you, that would be a, a paid for or a registered level of content. So those are the three primary uh, levels of content. Uh, Rob, did you want to speak a little bit to those? I, I was going to note right now um, we've been the the portal the portal itself is designed to have a, basically a, an unregistered component to it that gives you access to digital rebar features and and you know so you can access and use digital rebar without needing to register at all um, that's part of our design pattern and then there is uh, packages uh, for some of the workflow pieces and things like that that will be moved behind the registration wall. We haven't done that right now because we're still working out some of the registration process pieces. Um, it, it works, but it's we haven't we haven't uh, turned it on yet. So there are some things. The OS content it's all labeled as rack end pieces. The rack end pieces will eventually be moved behind the registration step. Um, and then the so it's actually if you click around, you'll see that it actually already tells you which things are which. Um, but right now everything's open. Okay, excellent. Uh, any other questions on features? If not, I think we'll just uh, give us a, well, I'll just run through a quick uh, list of some of the things uh, uh, in the existing feature set. A great question though, Will, and a great observation. Okay, so let me just um, blast through the feature stuff here real quick. We've got about 20 minutes left in the um, presentation. We also want to talk a little bit about uh, version 3.2 and if there's enough time left for a uh, workload deployment. I'm suspecting that we won't have enough time for that, but that's okay. Uh, we do have a pre-recorded demo of the workload deployment that's available for people to run through. Anyone in the field that wants to run through it would be interested in some feedback from that as well. Um, as far as the 3.1 features, um, the layered storage system, we touched on that very briefly. So the, the concept behind that is uh, it allows you to, it allows RackN to distribute content that we mark as read only. So as we develop content and as the community develops content, you can have a base level of content that is unchangeable and it allows for uh, versioning and revisioning of the content. And if someone makes changes to that content, how do you deal with the concept of folding in someone's in the field changes to your content that you deploy? Well, that's a sticky issue. It's almost, it's literally impossible to be able to say, here is our CentOS uh, 7 uh, content pack that allows you to deploy CentOS 7. And this is our uh, ver revision of how uh, that should be deployed and what that should look like. So the, the layered storage system allows you that read-only content layer. You can take that and clone it and make your own uh, unique changes to it and maintain your own change, changes to that. Uh, and then you have now a writable version of that content. As we update the CentOS 7 content pack, you now receive the uh, newest and greatest capabilities and features of that content pack. Obviously, that leaves you uh, with the operator. You have to sort out what changes you may or may not want to reflect back into your own writable content. But it does allow us a much cleaner solution to be able to do that upgrade scheme to uh, something that is often uh, very um, dynamic and changes a lot on your end environment. Uh, Rob, do you have any uh, discussions around that or thoughts around uh, the layered storage system? Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things that are, that are really important. One of them is, you know, Greg was talking about composability. Um, and the, it's not just that the boot ends are read-only and, and layered. It's actually that the, the composed parts of all the things are also read-only. And so if, you're work, if you take a boot end uh, that we build in community or maintain at Racken and you clone that and change it into something, 
if, as long as you reuse the pieces inside of that, the composed pieces inside, those are also going to be read only. And so you can count on, on those being maintained. So you're only adding uh, unless you really wanted to change a piece and you could do that too. But we've tried to make it so that, you know, even if you're making a, a big change to a new boot environment, then you, you're very likely to get the benefit of all the pieces that boot ends you're cloning from or building from. And then you could use the same thing, right? This isn't a rack end uh, specialized feature. It's the content. So there's an API that we added called contents and contents allow you to create, take all the other models in the system and create a YAML file or a JSON file and upload them as a single unit um, and distribute them that way. So if you're maintaining a digital rebar system or, or multiple digital rebar systems, you can then take artifacts and you can push them. You can actually pull them from one endpoint and then clone them to a whole bunch of other endpoints in this read only way. Um, so there's, there's some like top of rack switch deployment capabilities or edge capabilities or massively distributed uh, features beyond the idea that you could you know, get content from the community and share it and reuse it. Um, and there's one other feature that, that I, I like pointing out here um, that, that Victor insisted on um, and was right on, it was just perfectly on target. There's a bottom level of this where you could actually use Puppet or Chef or Ansible to build the, um, uh, the profiles and the content and the templates and lay them down even before digital rebar starts. And that way you actually can create this sort of bootstrap environment um, using traditional tools also. So if you're not comfortable using the API driven deployment, um, which we really like, you could still use Chef or Puppet. You could lay down a configuration and then use it, um, which is very chef, which is very Cobbler-like. So if you're used to Cobbler and Cobbler builds your big inventory list of everything uh, by Puppet, which 90% of the people we talk to do that, um, that's, that pattern also works with this um, very deliberately. That was a, a, a design choice to enable that pattern. It took a little bit of time. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So it truly is layered. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, moving down the stack, we've got um, the content packaging system, which we talked about a little bit. Um, it's a very cool capability to roll up a bunch of things into a single deployable unit. Uh, and uh, again, that interacts also with the layered storage system and that allows you to uh, push updates and uh, be able to safely apply those pushed updates from the content packaging system. Um, primary mechanism for deploying that content is uh, JSON or YAML uh, definitions and uh, ingesting that e through the API as uh, uh, payload in the API itself. Uh, or uh, within the Rackin environment, we have uh, the ability to publish content in packs through uh, what's currently in AWS S3 buckets. And you can literally just click in and point and click uh, new content packs and load those in. And it provides an awful lot of really interesting uh, capabilities that composes uh, both concepts of stages, tasks, jobs, templates, all of those things can be rolled up into a content pack so you can very quickly deploy a usable digital uh, rebar provision endpoint from a single content pack or two or three or however many, however you, you choose to, to, to decompose those capabilities. Um, in addition to that, there's the plugin system. So right now we don't have a whole lot of plugins um, since it's relatively new to digital rebar provision. But one of the interesting plugins that uh, we have is the ability to, uh, within the packet.net environment. So for those of you who don't know about packet.net, it's a uh, infrastructure as code uh, hosted bare metal uh, service provider. So you can go to them and say, I want N number of um, bare metal servers of type X, Y, or Z, and you just push button deploy them. They've done a really cool job of uh, taking uh, physical metal and uh, orchestrating and providing you the ability to deploy uh, services uh, very quickly on that. However, uh, Digital Rebar has seen uh, that there's some interesting things we can do with the Digital Rebar provision to allow you to more flexibly deploy code in that environment. However, since uh, Packet has uh, their own way of doing things to drive reboots and configurations of servers. Um, 
Rackin has developed a really cool uh, a plugin uh, called Packet-IPMI, which allows you to, through Packet's API services, uh, drive the reboot cycle and management of the, the Packet infrastructure in place. You know, things like uh, providing your Packet API key, the project that you want to uh, integrate with, uh, the reboot cycles and stuff like that. So that's one of those, uh, uh, I believe that one is... Uh, is the packet IPMI going to be a, a registered freeware or is that a registered pay for solution? Have we sorted that out? Re registered free. Registered free. So that allows you to, if you want to operate in the, the packet environment, you can add that plugin. So that's an interesting plugin that you can use. There's also a, a simple plugin called the Incrementer, which is an example plugin. So anyone that's interested in developing plugins, that's available on the uh, provision GitHub environment. So you can take a look at that as an example uh, plugin to help develop your own solution. Um, moving on, we have stages, tasks, and jobs. Now that's pretty interesting. Uh, very, very large uh, feature in my mind. It's, it's a huge feature because it, it, it takes the um, very simple notion of uh, API driven provisioning service and now you add a larger orchestration capability over that that allows you to do very complex things. Now, there, it's certainly not unique in the, 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 the world of provisioning, but um, I think that the way it's been decomposed to allow you to um, manage both some of the, the, the lower layer features like the layered storage system, the content package system, templates, um, boot environments, um, it's very, very fascinating. And, and as we're working with it, we're starting to see how powerful it really is. Um, yeah. Any discussions around that, Rob, Greg? Yeah. Uh, Victor? I felt like Greg. Go ahead. Yeah, no, this is, this is Greg. One of the things that I think from a use perspective that we tried to do with stages is we realized that uh, boot ends were getting overloaded in the 3.0 code tree in the sense that they were both becoming a, this is where I run things, and then it also was getting built into it, the I want to run these things or apply these things. And so part of what we tried to do with stages was to give you a separation so that you could say, that's my boot environment, and I don't really change it. It's what I kind of want to run from. And then... I want stages to be able to say, these are the tasks that I want to do, and I want to do these in a certain order, and I want to be able to add tasks and extend tasks. And one of the frustrations that I was having in trying to use the system was that I kept having to change a clone boot ends and make new boot ends and chain boot ends together, and I didn't necessarily, wasn't really changing any of the actual boot end pieces. So part of this plays into the content system and the rest of it in the sense that the hope is that a lot of times boot ends don't really need to change. They're fairly sta static. It's the task that I want to do or the, cha the ability to chain those together to get to a, a final goal. And that's what the stages bring. And then part of the kind of what I talked about earlier with regards to the getting fast feedback, being able to get immediate um, response to actions that are failing or not failing um, was was around the task system and the jobs in the sense that tasks are a way for us to say do this thing see if it works and then move on to the next task and stages are the way to like generate a set of those and then jobs are just the logs for those tasks so that you can say okay what went wrong did it work where'd it go and so that way you can see a sequence of events you can drive things the neat thing about where this has gone to some degree is on some of our um, like use cases where we've written a packet content that lets us add a stage into the discovery process so that we can detect if it's on a packet environment, automatically start applying profiles and automatically adding things to the node as we go forward so that down the, in the next stages, things like the IPMI plugin or the packet IPMI plugin function, right? Um, and that way I don't have to change the boot environment. I don't have to do that. I can deal with more dynamic nature of dynamic environments. Um, it's kind of the whole basis for the stages, right? 
Awesome. It, great, great info. Great. I would, appreciate that. I would, I would add uh, one or two points that, on this. One is it's super fast. Um, yeah. Right. It's, it's not hard to learn and it is much faster because of the way we, we there, there's actually a real innovation inside of this pattern um, that we, that I haven't seen before in how we handle the job queuing system and how we hand off between the, the node that we're doing the work on and the server. Um, it's probably a topic for a whole, a whole community session to talk about this. We inverted the control paradigm. Um, and while digital rebar maintains control, the server is able to pull down and execute jobs, um, without SSH access being granted very fast. And so, we're seeing us flow into stage by stage by stage too fast for people to track. Um, whereas in the past, if you looked at any of, you know, Chef Puppet Ansible or the way Digital Rebar V2 did things, it was, it, you know, it was automated, but it was pokey. Um, but in comparison to this, it, it's one of those remarkable things. It's like, oh, it's done. Um, and when people, people, you know, y'all deal with hardware, you don't get to say that very often. You don't get surprised by the time, time elements. It's been an, uh, this has been a remarkably um, effective and fast and simple um, way to do the workflows. I wouldn't call it orchestration. I'd call it workflow. <laughs> okay. We'll stay away from orchestration. then. Or orchestration, I think, from our perspective, is things like Terraform which we have a nice plugin for and uh, uh, Ansible and Ansible play uh, playbook. You know, those things I think we're considering more workflow. This is, or, or this is orchestration. This is really control workflow. Absolutely. A uh, good point on the uh, Terraform plugin I failed to mention is that that is a very exciting plugin that allows you to take Terraform uh, orchestration and apply that to bare metal using DRP to drive bare metal deployment. Uh, through Terraform, in addition to all of the other capabilities that you get <clears throat> with cap uh, Terraform deployments. Very cool feature. Uh, we're running uh, short here on time. We have about five minutes left, uh, and we're <clears throat> still got a bit to go. Uh, uh, but the, we have on the agenda still left to discuss uh, 3.2. Uh, one of the primary questions we wanted to pose to the community was, uh, how we want to manage uh, DRP version uh, planning and feature capabilities going forward. Some of the examples that we came up with that seem to work in the community um, are Trello boards and GitHub has a project capability somewhat similar to Trello boards. Um, do we have a feeling uh, of a solution that we'd like to uh, implement and use within uh, the digital rebar provision community? Uh, in terms of how to manage adding features and larger uh, capabilities? I, I myself am a Trello user, so that's comfortable. But um, the, that being said, everything else is in GitHub, right? So, and if it's, if it's much like it, and it seemed to be when I glanced at it, um, if you do a Kanban type of thing, that seemed six, one half dozen of the other to me. And then it's all on GitHub. Yeah, the, the integration with the, the GitHub portion of the GitHub projects is uh, probably the uh, uh, most compelling feature, I think, in terms of that solution. Uh, did you have any thoughts, uh, uh, Rob, in terms of what direction you're interested in seeing uh, that go? I, I agree with what Will was saying, okay. 100%. Uh, so clearly uh, in... I can deploy DRP pretty fast, but I'm not going to get it done in three minutes uh, with prep of <laughs> the environment. So uh, I think what we'll do is just uh, summarize a little bit. Um, actually, I think one of the features we didn't touch on was the hosted portal. And if I can share my screen here uh, very quickly, uh, how do I do just everything? Desktop. There we I, go. I, while you do that, I have a, I have a question, right? I, we want to start having a regular cadence on these meetings. We were thinking every other, other week. Um, there's a backlog of demos and capabilities to talk about. Um, uh, I was going to suggest we, we, could, we could meet weekly uh, to catch up, but why don't we stick to a bi-week, uh, every other week cadence. Okay. Um, 
Well, we'll if definitely we uh, keep it, our ears open if anyone community. wants to go. Yeah, if we want to go faster. Um, so what it I've done real quickly, say that again? It would let us show new things and get feedback more quickly. If yep. people are willing to meet every week, we could, we could actually have a meeting that talked about, you know, a new feature in the portal or a new feature coming in in digital rebar or content. And we could actually do Q and a, um, right. but we have to have, there has to be interest because, okay. right. It, it, go ahead. Shane, sorry. So uh, in the last two minutes here, we'll wrap up with just a very fast 60 seconds uh, overview of the rack and portal in the background. You see my terminal running with a digital rebar provision machine. Uh, in foreground mode, not detached, so you can actually see the DRP server outputting uh, stuff. In this case, what you're seeing is uh, in the packet.net environment, a node was booted and set to IPixie against DRP, and so you're seeing the API calls there that occurred. Uh, the endpoint login with the uh, login credentials, and you're presented with this global setup view which allows you to see a real quick sort of what we're calling a system wizard of your, your availability or a ready state for deployment and configuration. Uh, and we see that our content boot environments, ISOs, preferences, and machines are all green. We've got that configured and available. Subnets is not available. However, in the packet.net environment, we don't need to create a specific subnet because we dynamically respond to packet.net um, infrastructure uh, queries, and that's part of the, the packet plugin capability. So you don't need to create a subnet. Uh, and if we take a look at the overview, we see we have a single node or a single machine that has been um, provisioned or discovered by us rather. And under the uh, left panel, we have our, our major breakdown of our system, our network, uh, our provisioning, our control, synchronization, upload, and endpoint admin. Um, we see we have a machine we can also see the profiles. We see that we have a packet console profile, a global profile, which has a stage map, which refers to a little bit of the workflow stuff we touched on a little bit earlier, which goes through the transitional uh, steps uh, that allow you to do the larger workflow capabilities. See, Rob, I'm avoiding orchestration. Uh, and then in our plugins, we have the packet IP, my plugin itself. I don't have any of the keys plumbed in here yet because I didn't want to show those. Um, and again, like I said, there are no subnets in the packet environment. Uh, and we're not using leases or reservations. We do have the boot environments. We've loaded the uh, uh, digital uh, rebar uh, rack end content, which allows us these additional extensions. One of those things is a CentOS uh, 7 install. So we see that we actually have the CentOS 7 uh, uh, boot environment can, here and the ISO has been loaded and available. Uh, in contrast, if you had an ISO that's not actually ready and available, you'd see that it gives us some status and feedback. We're missing ISO. We have some errors. These are all standard uh, uh, things. The next step in this case would be to push the ISO to the DRP endpoint server. Um, and we see a, a bit of the actual uh, templates that are used as part of the composability of creating a larger or, uh, workflow. Uh, and deployment capabilities. Uh, parameters uh, can be applied dynamically into the templates and uh, profiles to do uh, larger things. And wrapping up very quickly here, uh, we have our stages, and stages is part of the content that was loaded as well. And you see that we have a, a number of these stages in different states of readiness for use. Um, Tasks are, are part of the uh, uh, workflow capability within the stages that uh, we've deployed. So we have change stage, discover UUID from packet, and we have packet SSH keys, which allows us to inject SSH keys from the packet portal. And SSH access allows you to put those SSH keys in place uh, as well. And then uh, we have one node boot and that generated three dynamic jobs. So we see some of the jobs here. And then the content, uh, we had loaded the OS discovery, OS Linux, and the packet. Those are the three content packs that were loaded to enable us to operate within the packet.net environment. And you can see on the right panel under organizational content, there's a number of other content that you can pull in.
Uh, that's sort of uh, a little bit over on our time there. We did start a little late. Let's go ahead and wrap up um, the end of our version 001 meetup. Uh, we're scheduled right now October 10th. Uh, uh, two weeks from today for V002. Uh, so please keep an eye on the meetup.com uh, website for more details there. Uh, we'll, we'll take some feedback from the community offline here as well and see if we want to move to uh, more uh, uh, rapid cadence. We'll do a weekly cadence to do some more demos and discussions there. So we, we might be coming out a little bit more rapidly. So keep an eye on uh, meetup.com where we'll um, discuss some of those capabilities in next week's uh, uh, or the next iteration are we're initially planning on doing uh, oh I haven't actually posted it yet to meetup.com yet so <laughs> little fail there uh, we'll talk a little bit about the 3.2 features and capabilities we'll do some I think we're planning on doing a Kubernetes deployment and we'll talk about content packs as well uh, any last words, Rob, there? That was awesome. Shane, thank you for hosting. This is great. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. We look forward to seeing you either in two weeks or a week or if we decide to move earlier. Uh, again, keep your eyes on meetup.com. And thank you, everybody, for showing up. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you.